Uh, this is an extension of a series of debates which I've been having with John for some years now. We're all familiar with this formula, x counts as y in context C, and the original theory underlying this formula, which is to be found already in speech act, is that uh, a theory according to which x and y are one and the same part of physical reality, which is of course the only reality there is for John. Uh, but they are such as to fall under different descriptions. And so x counts as y in context C would be something like this particular man counts as president in the context of United States politics. Uh, the main thesis of this talk is that there are important provinces of institutional reality which have no underlying x term. So the y term is then free-floating. It exists, but not as part of physical reality, which is a big problem for John, because on the one hand, at least in his writings up to about the construction of social reality, this, this formula was meant to give an account of institutional reality. But on the other hand, as I will show, there are many important parts of institutional reality for which there is no physical X term. Rather, the Y term exists because there are certain sorts of documents. So there are documents to the effect that debt exists, for instance, but there's nothing physical underlying the debt. And similarly, if, if, you, if you put money in a bank account now, they don't keep the money in a box in its physical stuffiness. Rather, they just make an entry into some computer and then in principle they might shred the money you want nucleate the money, and then the money in your bank account is merely represented by blips in the bank's computer. The, the representations here are the documentation in virtue of which the money exists, but there is nothing more than documentation. And therefore, to understand these matters, freestanding Y terms, properly, we need to pay careful attention to the role of documents and representations in the architecture of institutional reality. And, and John has agreed to this much. So, first of all, just for fun, I have a medico-ontological preamble, which might be subtitled, What Happens When the Federal Government, the U.S. Federal Government, Gets Involved in Ontology. So there is something called GenBank, which is a, a large and uh, federally mandated genetic database, which is collated by the National Center for Biotechnology Information in Washington, D.C. When it says National Center, it means it's a federal government organization. Um, GenBank defines gene as follows. A gene is a DNA region of biological interest, so far, so good, with a name. And that carries a genetic trait or phenotype. What this means is that every time a gene is named, that gene pops into existence, or for the first time in its career, becomes a gene. Now, this sort of mistake, this sort of confusion between entities and documentation is not only characteristic of federal government ontology, it's characteristic of all computer science ontology. They, they systematically confuse concepts and the entities which they are concepts of. Second example. There is something called health level 7 reference information model. This, this sort of syntax is also characteristic of federal ontology. HL7 RIM. <laughs> and um, the, H, the ontology of HL7 RIM, interestingly enough, is based on speech act theory. So HL7 RIM is a standardized way of formulating patient data. And according to the uh, preamble to the HL7 RIM standards, the medical record is not a collection of facts, but a faithful record of what clinicians have heard, seen, thought, and done. Its act class represents what is known as speech act in linguistics and philosophy. <laughs> so, examples. The, the, there are different moods. These are the different kinds of speech acts. There's the definition mood, which, for instance, specifies the act of obtaining blood glucose. There's, I don't know why it's called the definition mood, but that's what they say. There is the intent mood, which corresponds to an act of announcing 
someone should obtain blood glucose. And then there's the order mood, where, which corresponds to someone requesting that please obtain blood glucose. There's the event mood, which corresponds to someone stating that blood glucose was obtained. And then there's the goal mood, which, in which the author states that our goal is to be able to obtain blood glucose with a given value range. There are hundreds of pages like this. Um, I've, I've selected those, pa those sentences which are still in moderately sensible syntax. So acts have moods and they come in sequences. First of all, you issue a request and then you actually take the blood glucose and then you document that you took the blood glucose and so on. So an activity in the real world may progress from defined through planned and ordered to executed which is represented as the mood of the act. This is the original grammar. It is often critical that a permanent and faithful record be maintained of this progression. That's fine. Uh, that's the electronic patient record, which is the holy grail of medical informatics. HL7 RIM certainly is not this holy grail. It's a mess. Not only for the reasons which I will now demonstrate. So, this is the ontology of HL7 RIM. And the syntax is as in the original. This is typical of linguists. This stuff was mainly written by linguists. Act, as statements or speech acts, are the only representation of real-world facts or processes in the HL7 RIM. The truth about the real world is constructed through a combination and arbitration of such attributed statements only. And there is no class in the RIM whose objects represent near quotes, objective states of affairs, or near quotes, real processes independent from attributed statements. As such, that this, they say this, this actually, is a yeah. Yeah. there is no distinction between an activity and its documentation. This is medicine we're talking about. <laughs> Every act belongs, includes both to varying degrees. So you can't do medicine in silence. <laughs> now, this failure to distinguish between facts and their representations or between objects and concepts, as I say, is endemic in linguistics. So, just to quote one example at, at random, uh, the world is, it is as it is, independent of any concept, belief, or knowledge. So far, so good. Minds, in other words, cannot create reality. So far, so good. But then, I would like to suggest that this is false. <laughs> <laughs> and that it is contradicted by just about everything known in cultural anthropology. <laughs> now, as I say, the same failure is endemic in computer and information science. This, I believe, is the world's worst, worst ontological sentence. <laughs> Concepts, also known as classes, are used in a broad sense. <laughs> they can be abstract or concrete, elementary or composite, real or fiction. In short, a concept can be anything about which something is said, and therefore could also be the description of a type, function, action, strategy, reasoning process, etc. So this confuses concepts with descriptions with classes with things that we can talk about. So, why is it important that HL7 says that there is no distinction between an activity and this, its documentation? Well, first of all, HL7 has very influential backers. And there are branches of HL7 now spreading their tentacles throughout the world. HL7 is going to become an international standard for medical language. There's even HL7 merchandise that you can buy. <laughs> HL7 sweatshirts. But... It, this is federally mandated ontological confusion. <laughs> all, US federal, all U.S. federal agencies are required to adopt HL7 medic messaging standards to ensure that each federal agency can share information that will improve coordinated care for patients. So it's important. It's probably too late to get this right, but IFOMIS is going to try. So, now let's move on to something relatively more peaceful. So, the ontology of war. Uh, war is fought by presidents and generals and the like, and the generals issue orders, which are called speech acts. But, of course, 
the really important part of the war is events on the ground. Without events on the ground, there is no war. If generals just talk, or just have bad thoughts about each other, there is no war. We're all agreed about that, I hope. So let's see what... Uh, the, 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 let's formulate that, that by saying that war is an essentially two-leveled affair. It includes speech acts plus physical a actions, and the physical actions are the really important thing. You need certain sorts of speech acts to have a war. Otherwise, it would just be a fight. But war is different from wrestling in this respect. Re wrestling is just a one-level affair. You just fight. Physical actions are enough. Now, what about chess? A game of chess, well, chess is war in attenuated form, someone once said. So, um, chess is made up of physical movements of physical pieces of wood, or ivory, or whatever it might be. And there are thoughts going on in the minds of the chess players, but the thoughts are not really part of the game of chess. And sometimes the game of chess can be re recorded in documents, but the records are not part of the game of chess. The game of chess is just physical movements of physical pieces of wood. Now, what about a game of blind chess? Here there are no pieces of wood, and there are no physical movements. So there are just thoughts. And, and, and here, the records and representations are indispensable. Unless the thoughts are somehow communicated, there is no game of chess. So what is a game of blind chess? How are we to understand this thing? I want to argue that this is an example of a freestanding white chess. There is no physical foundation to it. There are documents, representations of one sort or another, in people's minds, for instance, but there are no, there's no physical basis for the game of chess itself, if chess is analogous to war. Uh, it's not clear that chess could be analogous to wrestling, but... Um, now, my colleague in Buffalo objected to this line of thought. He argued that a normal chess game is not analogous to war. It doesn't consist of movements of pieces on a board at all, or essentially. Rather, it consists of two alter alternating sequences of act acts on the part of the players. These are intentional acts of, in the normal case, moving pieces on a board. And a game of blind chess also consists of alter alternating sequences of acts. But now these are speech acts which represent, which represent the moves of pieces on the, on the board. And representing the movements takes the place of actually carrying out the movements. Now, I think that this is a... I think John Kearns is wrong. And he's wrong precisely because chess truly is analogous to war. The, the, the commands which are issued by the generals are the acts, the intentional acts going on in the parties to the chess game. But the game itself is the movement of pieces on the board. So, according to John and Kearns, a normal chess game doesn't consist of movements of pieces, but the two alternating sequences of acts on the part of the players. How would this apply in the case of war? It can't be applied. So I want to argue that the game of blind chess is something non-physical. The thought, and that means also non-biological, non-neurological, and non-mental. The thoughts in the minds of the players and their successive utterances are not part of the game. They belong, rather, to the domain of records and representation. Um, the, the, the game of blind chess is something non-physical. This is my general account of what freestanding white terms are. It's an abstract pattern which is, however, tied to a specific historical locus. It's tied to specific players and to a specific historical occasion. So it's, it's historical but still abstract entity. It exists because there are representations in the form of speech acts of the parties involved, but we shouldn't confuse what exists because of representations with those representations themselves. Similarly, in the case of a debt. In the case of a debt, again, we have an abstract pattern. In this case, it's a deontic pattern. 
tied to a specific party and to a specific initiating event. We have thoughts and worries and so on, and we have records and representations, if we're lucky. But the debt is not to be confused with any of these other things. It belongs to the realm of freestanding Y terms rather than to the realm of Y terms which have X terms. So, this, this will be familiar to everyone in the room. In, uh, in speech acts, uh, John already makes the distinction between regulative rules like the rules of polite table behavior, which regulate antecedently existing forms of behavior. And um, constituted rules, which create new forms of behavior, as the rules of chess create the very possibility of our engaging in the type of activity we call playing chess. And these rules have the basic form X counts as Y in context C. And examples are, you, you, you make a certain arm movement and this counts as signaling to turn left. Or you make an utterance of the form, I promise to mow the lawn, and this counts as putting yourself under a corresponding obligation. So here we have two events, two physical events. One is an event of utterance, and the other is the event of putting yourself under a corresponding obligation. And these are, physically speaking, the very same event. This is the X term for this Y term. So X counts as Y in a certain context. This is, these are the sorts of cases for which the theory was designed to work and for which it does work. So the, and here, interestingly, the Y term characteristically marks something that has consequences in the form of rewards, penalties, obligations, and the like. And now we, uh, we go one step further. When you perform a speech act like this, then you create what he calls an institutional fact, which means a fact whose existence presupposes the existence of certain systems of such constituted rules. And these systems are called institutions. And examples of institutions are money, property, marriage, and government. Now, in the bulk of the construction of social reality is examples like this which play the role of moving the argument along. And there are all cases where, before computers at least, there were pieces of physical stuff which formed the underlying X terms. So they used to use pieces of metal and paper for money. Uh, property is usually something that is physical stuff, like a piece of ivory. Uh, again, before the invention of computers, that was overwhelming in the case. Uh, when you get married, there, is, there are two organisms, both of which are pieces of physical stuff, which count as husbands and wives from a certain point in time. And governments are made up of organisms, likewise, which are also pieces of physical stuff. So these are all cases where we have an X term, more or less unproblematic too. And in chess too, we have typically an X term, which is a piece of wood or a piece of ivory. Or and in baseball, necessarily, we have physical X terms. You can't play blind baseball. Well, I suppose you could if you had a good, really good computer program. <laughs> I'll come back to that. So, constitutive rules affect our behavior in the following way. Where such rules obtain, we can perform certain special types of activities, for instance, playing chess, and in virtue of this, our behavior can be interpreted both by ourselves and by others in, in, in terms of certain very special types of institutional concepts, and this implies, this has all sorts of deontic consequences. And that's what ties institutional reality together. Now, the challenge which Searle puts for himself in the construction of social reality is to develop an ontology of social reality that is both realist and naturalistic. So realism is social reality exists, it is not a mere fiction. The first axiom of realist ontology is nothing is certain except death and taxes. Death is for medical ontology and taxes is for social ontology. So if you're a realist, you have to believe that taxes exist. And I don't mean taxes that take you to your hotel, I mean ta the taxes that you pay every year 
and which are freestanding right terms. So, Searle wants to be a realist about taxes and, I suppose, about debt. But he also wants to be a naturalist. Now, th this, I think, is a very big issue, what Searle's naturalism amounts to, particularly these days. But um, the, the official view, as I read it, is, 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 is there is one world and everything in it is governed by the laws of physics and therefore also governed by the laws of biology and neurology. And then the question is whether with, with his newfound gaps and with his newfound selves, so is still a naturalist in this sense or whether we need to have a broadened sense of naturalism. And if so, can it accommodate freestanding Y terms? which are certainly not subject to the laws of physics. So, social reality, because of these uh, constitutive rules which, which give rise to deontic powers, enables to impose special sorts of rights, duties, obligations on our fellow human beings and on the reality around us. So we can go from social reality to institutional reality. And as, as Searle says, this involves a kind of magic we can make deontic powers pop out of physics just by treating each other in certain special ways in accordance with constitutive rules. So, institutional facts are social facts involving a deontic component. They are facts which arise when human beings collectively award status functions to parts of reality, which means Functions those parts of reality could not perform exclusively in virtue of their physical properties. So, a line of paint in the middle of the road performs deontic functions, not because of the chemical qualities of the pigment, but it performs those functions nonetheless. And all of this works by a cell set up to roughly the construction of social reality. This, all of this works by a constitutive rule. The, the line of paint counts as some sort of uh, traffic sign or warning sign in certain contexts. So, naturalism, of course, implies that both the X and the Y terms in Searle's formula have to arrange in every case over token physical entities. Indeed, the same token physical entity, Bill Clinton, has to serve in both the X term when he's just a man and in the Y term when he's a president. And similarly, a, a man and a woman are the X terms which correspond to a husband and a wife. And husbands and wives have special status and powers. So that's a president, that's a California driving license, and that's a cathedral, and that's a wife and a husband. And this thing can be iterated, so X counts as Y. Y can then serve itself as an X term for a new counting as a new application of the rule, uh, so that status functions can be imposed upon physical reality as it has already been shaped by earlier impositions of functions. But you still never leave the realm of physics. You just get new, more sophisticated descriptions according to the original formula. So, because of naturalism, this imposition of function gives us nothing ontologically new. Bill Clinton is still Bill Clinton even when he counts as president, and Miss Anku is still Miss Anku even when she counts as Mrs. Beach. So, while each white term is in a sense a new entity, so President Clinton did not exist before his inauguration, this new entity is from the physical perspective exactly the same old entity as it was. Or. The only thing which has changed is the way the entity is treated in certain contexts and the descriptions under which it falls. And there's an important reason, in addition to naturalism, why Searle insists upon this. We don't want there to be turtles all the way down, so there has to be something somewhere where we stop. We can't impose Y terms, he thinks, on Y terms, on Y terms, on Y terms, with no bottom eventually the hierarchy must bottom out in phenomena whose existence is not a matter of human agreement. Now, I agree with this. Documents and representations are going to be physical, or at least neurophysical. 
So this part is fine. What's the, the problem is with naturalism. Now, another wrinkle to the story, which it's important to make clear at this stage, the, the range of the X and Y terms includes not only individual substances like Bill Clinton or uh, George W. Bush or John Driver's license, but also events like uttering. And it could include uh, entities in other ontological categories also. So, an act of uttering counts as Notice that it counts as the making of a promise, not as a promise. So, naturalism applies to these cases would say that when a given event counts as the making of a promise, then the event doesn't physically change. No new event comes into being. Just as when President Bush becomes president, no new entity comes into being. No new physical entity. What happens merely is that the event with which we start is treated in a special way. Namely, it's not just treated as an acoustic blast, it's treated as a deontic phenomenon. Now, this account of promising works when the Y term exists simultaneously with the corresponding X term, and similarly for all other categories. So, an audio acoustic blast counts as an utterance of English, an utterance of English counts as the making of a promise. Here the blast, the utterance, and the making of the promise are all simultaneous. They have to be because they're identical, because every Y term is identical physically with the X term. But then the question is, and this is the turtle's question, how can an event which lasts just two seconds be the bearer or the ontological support or the physical foundation of deontic powers such as claims and obligations which continue to exist for several months? And the obvious answer is that it can't be. <laughs> because there is no green printed paper, no organism, no building which is available to serve as external in the future. There might be a representation. You might write down your agreement in a piece of paper, but that's just the documentation of the agreement. It's not the agreement itself, and it's certainly not the obligation. Now, Searle's original response to this challenge was rather strange. It was to assert that he'd already solved it in speech acts. So, my analysis originally started with speech acts, he said, and the whole purpose of a speech act such as promising is to create an obligation that will continue to exist after the original promise has been made. But that's not an answer to the objection. So, he said, I promised something on Tuesday and the act of uttering ceases on Tuesday, but the obligation of the promise continues to exist over Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So, the obligation of the promise here is a freestanding white. There's no X. Now, after a lot of bullying, he finally admitted freestanding Y terms. Actually, no, this is wrong. I take that back. Already in the construction of social reality, without realizing it, he admitted freestanding Y terms. Um, but after a lot of bullying, he admitted it explicitly. Um, so, this is the passage. Um, I think this is in the reply to me in that. Volume. It's not just an odd feature of speech acts, it is characteristic of the deontic structure of institutional reality. So think, for example, of creating a corporation. Once the act of creation of the corporation is completed, the corporation exists. It need have no physical realization. It may just be a set of status functions. Now this is to admit freestanding Y terms, because there is no X term that he admits. There are documents but there is no X term underlying a corporation. Um, and then Searle insists further that the whole point of institutional facts is that once created, they continue to exist as long as they are recognized, which means that many institutional facts can be free standing white terms, which just have this power to continue to exist as long as they are recognized. You do not need the X term once you have created the Y status function. Now this is this is a very important sentence here. Remember that so far the X term and the Y term have been identical. Bill Clinton, President Clinton. A 
piece of cardboard, a California driving line, a dollar, a piece of paper, a dollar bill, X, Y. But here we shift from the X term to a Y status function. The Y status function is a freestanding Y term. It's in the market for an X term, but it, its hunger is not satisfied. And that doesn't matter, he says, because you don't need an X term for such abstract entities as obligations, responsibilities, rights, duties, and other day on phenomena. And these are, or so I maintain, the heart of the ontology of institutional reality. Now, this is exactly the view I'm defending. Freestanding Y terms are abstract entities tied to specific historical locations and specific parties. But this is not naturalism. These are not parts of physical reality. So, how can self naturalism comprehend the freestanding Y terms which he ha himself has acknowledged? How can obligations, responsibilities, rights, duties, corporations, and blind chess games exist in the very same reality that is described by physics and biology? Well, let's go back to blind chess. So the, the idea is that a blind chess game is an abstract entity which exists because of documentations. A, blind chess which ha a game of blind chess which has only mental documentations, mental representations, exists only so long as those mental representations exist themselves. It unfolds itself once. None of these things coincide with any part of physical reality. And... Um, so they're like money in your bank account. This is the original formulation. All sorts of things can be money, but there has to be some physical realization, some brute fact, even if it's only a bit of paper or a slip on a computer, on which we can impose our institutional form of status function. That was Sell's original account of money. And this is because of turtles. There can be no institutional facts without brute facts. But then... I argued that a blip on a computer doesn't count as money at all. And the proof of it is, is if you take a blip on a computer into a store and try and buy something with it, you won't get very far. We, in fact, we don't impose status functions on blips on computers to get money. We impose status functions on blips on computers to get representations of money. And uh, Searle admitted this, so on a, in print even, on at least one point, Smith has shown that the account I gave in the construction of social reality is mistaken. I say that one form that money takes is magnetic traces on computer disks, and another form is credit cards. And strictly speaking, neither of these is money. Both are different representations of money. Actually, this is wrong, as Leo makes clear to me. A credit card isn't even a representation of money. A credit card is used to create an obligation on the part of your bank to transfer money in the future and your credit card receipt is a representation of that obligation. So credit cards are really miraculous things. You can use them to create obligations on the part of your bank. Just think about that. <laughs> so, but blips in computers merely, merely represent money just as title deeds merely register the existence of a property right or an IOU note records the existence of a debt. It does not count of the debt. It records the existence of the debt. And the proof of that is if you burn the IOU note, the debt by accident, then the debt would still exist. So mental acts do not count as obligations any more than blips in computers count as money. Mental acts do not count as moves in chess games. Worries do not count as debts. Rather, all of these things belong to the domain veins of records and registrations and documents and records. So, it's certainly true that the credit card can be used in a way that is in many respects functionally equivalent to money, but even so, as Searle admits, it's not itself money. And then he said, it would be a fascinating project to work out the role of these different sorts of representations of institutional facts. And, so I'm coming to the end now. Um, since these are abstract entities, which are tied to a historical location, this means that they have special properties which... Bill Clinton and other pieces of biological stuff never have. We can manipulate them mathematically. And this is, this is the key to understanding the ontology of the world of finance. 
Because we, the world of finance takes advantage of the abstract status of freestanding Y terms to manipulate them in quasi-mathematical ways. So we can pool and collateralize assets, we can securitize loans, we can consolidate debts, and we can do many other things with, with, by derivatives trading. We can invent new structures in the realm of finance. And this is possible because of the, uh, well, first of all, because of the elasticity of freestanding Y terms. We don't need to worry about the physics. And also because of the mathematical abstractness of freestanding Y terms. So, this is the new view of the ontology of social reality which I want to defend. And this is the pre anti penultimate slide. Um, so, what do we do? First of all, we describe those social entities, lawyers, doctors, traffic signs, speeches, coronations, weddings, and so on, which coincide with physical objects or events. These are the, the examples which play the central role in the plot of the construction of social reality. And they provide a solid scaffolding which holds together the various levels of institutional reality. But the various levels can become ever more complicated through the imposition of ever new complexes of status functions. Now, these social entities, the physical ones, the ones which have X terms, provide this physical web of institutional facts. But within this physical web, there are gaps. And within these gaps are to be found freestanding Y terms, which are sustained in being by records and representations. The records and representations belong to the physical scaffold. The freestanding Y terms are held up there in the web. And then, of course, these freestanding Y terms can themselves give rise to new elevated pillars in this great edifice. So freestanding Y terms are entities of a third kind. They're neither phys real physical entities nor abstract platonic entities existing outside time and space. Rather, they're abstract entities which are tied to history and to specific contexts of human behavior. And then freestanding why money does not tarnish, does not burn, is not subject to physical processes. Its existence in time, rather, has this form. It either does or it doesn't exist. It, do it doesn't get eroded. It's not eaten by uh, fungi. Now, U.S. consumer transactions in U.S billions of dollars in 2001 were already such that there are more than twice as many billions of dollars spent in the realm of freestanding white terms than in the realm of physical cash. And in 2020, so these are all freestanding white money, 2020, there will be three times as much in the way of economic transactions carried out with freestanding white money than with physical cash. And so, when we are all just socializing brains in a vat, the entirety of institutional reality will consist only of freestanding white terms. And that's it. Uh, well, I hadn't seen this uh, before, so my uh, uh, response is just off the top of my head. I don't see any problem with naturalism at all. Uh, and I was uh, puzzled that um, uh, Barry makes use of the old Cartesian category of the physical. Uh, that's a handy way of talking, but what we're talking about is that the sense in which I'm a naturalist is the obvious sense in which we live in one world. Uh, a, a, the Cartesian vocabulary slices it up into the mental and the physical, and then there are these guys like uh, Frege and Popper who want to say, no, there's a third realm. And I, that's anti-naturalism. My sense of naturalism is we live in one world and all these things are part of it. Um, now, Barry uh, gives me a challenge, though, and the challenge is, well, in what sense does the obligation exist as a part of this one world? What is its ontology, given that the making of the promise only took two seconds and the obligation can go on for years? That's the challenge, right? And I thought I answered that um, in the chapter in uh, the construction where I said what really counts is not the logical structure of the imposition of status function, but the acceptance of the deontic powers. 
uh, where I say the basic, I, I forget what page that's on, I haven't been a copy of the book here, but there is a, uh, I, I, don't, I don't, I mean, uh, I, I take it, <laughs> nobody's here who hasn't read this book, and they probably read it more recently than I have. Um, but I, I say all this in a chapter called The General Theory of Institutional Facts, and there I say there's really one primitive notion, and that is we collectively accept that S has the power that S does A. And then following the great tradition of, of uh, deontic logic and uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, law of modal interchange and modal logic, I try to show how you can define all uh, of these deontic powers in terms of this one primitive. Now that to me is an interesting question. I'm not sure that part succeeds. But I don't see a problem for the naturalism at all. Uh, the question is, what are the attitudes that people have that sustain the system of deontology, which constitutes, for me, the glue that holds civilization together, the system of rights, duties, obligations, and so on? Now, Barry has an alternative suggestion for rescuing the naturalism, and I think it's wrong. Uh, the alternative suggestion is, no, the glue that holds everything together that makes it really um, naturalistic are physical representations. Now, I'm sure that's wrong because there are lots of, of uh, things where you don't have to have it written down, where the obligation to keep a promise, uh, we're all friends and, and we know perfectly well uh, what my obligation to you is. You get in complex structures, you have to have writing because of our intellectual limitations. So you have to have these representations. I am not in any way belittling the role of the representation. But for the most part, the role of the representation is epistemic. Uh, it tells you uh, what, uh, 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 what the facts are about the deontology so that no one can forget. You've got the document, the IOU, that says uh, you owe me, or I owe you the money. But that it document is supposed to give you an epistemic grip on the underlying ontology, which is deontic. Now, I said for the most part, and that's why I think we need to work it out. The fascinating thing about paper money is, of course, these used to be representations of money. That is to say, uh, it was the case that in the early days of paper money that it said, even said on the uh, $20 uh, bill in my childhood, that it was a promissory uh, note. It, that the Treasury promised to pay you $20 on demand. So it wasn't actually money. Uh, in, but it, then this was a case where the representation of money could function as money and so became money. But when I said it would be fun to work out the details, that would be uh, interesting, and I haven't worked out the details. But I'm pretty confident uh, that you, you don't... Uh, a, what Barry says is no challenge whatever to naturalism. And B, uh, the reason that he... Um, the reason it seems puzzling to him is he left out what to me is the crucial thing. Namely, all this about relationships between people. You see, when you create the corporation, what happens? Well, of course, legally, you bring a new entity into existence. And as philosophers, that ought to seem, you know, we're all going to get a headache. I mean, is it, uh, are we going to get, is it naturalism? Are we really going to have a problem with our ontology? Because the corporation exists but doesn't weigh anything. But if you actually look at what's going on, what happens when you create the corporations is you create a whole lot of deontic powers. You create the guy who is the head of the corporation, and you create the officer of the corporation, and they have obligations. Do they ever? I used to be the secretary of a corporation, and I discovered I was violating the Well, I won't go into it. Uh, I won't go into the details of the laws of the state of California. But I think that's the key out that the key out of um, uh, uh, Barry's puzzle is to see what we're really talking about are power relations between people. And what sustains those are the, the collective acceptance. It's the attitudes that people have. And the representations play a role, but the role is not to rescue naturalism. Naturalism doesn't re re need rescuing. Naturalism is doing perfectly well. Now, he, he did ask me, well, what exactly is, is, uh, in my, is my theory of naturalistic? Uh, two uh, pillars of naturalism are crucial. One is, we live in one world. We don't live in two worlds or three worlds. We live ontologically in one world that's got all these different features and we have to show how they relate to each other in relations of mutual dependence. 
And from what we know about that world, the absolute rock bottom is entities that we uh, find it convenient, not entirely accurate, but convenient to call particles. They exist in fields of force, and they're organized into systems. Now, that's the rock bottom ontology. And then from there on, you go on to uh, biology and uh, uh, the, uh, um, the other parts of what I construe to be physics, broadly speaking. Okay, that's the first pillar of naturalism. The second pillar of naturalism is you don't involve explanatory devices for your philosophical problems, which, do, which are not independently motivated by their need in the rest of your account of this one reality. So you do not postulate any, a special kind of transcendentalism to give you an explanation of the philosophical difficulties. The explanatory devices, the explanatory models for philosophy are those that have to work generally. Um, I, I, I think that we could debate the issue of naturalism further, particularly if one takes passages from here where you, you, play a great, you lay a great emphasis on physics. But I, I would prefer to debate the, um, the question which you said was the real challenge, namely how do we... Um, how, how can a two-second long utterance serve as the support for a five-year long obligation? And I think that your answer here is just you, you're, you're smuggling the problem under the carpet. So you say that we solve this problem by saying that when we have the utterance, that gives rise to some sort of dispersed collective acceptance through the, uh, through the community. But if we examine the, this matter very carefully, it may be that, um, this, well, first of all, we don't want to say that the neuro neurology of the people who collectively accept is going to serve as the physical foundation for the obligation. That would be to assume that deontic powers have to be a function of physical powers, which is wrong. But we do need to look at when things exist. And the acceptance exists continuously for five years, where the acceptings on the part of individuals exist um, um, uh, just as episodically as the original utterance. And it's the same with a corporation. You say, when you create the corporation, what happens legally is that you bring a new entity into existence, which seems to cause a problem, this one big entity called a corporation. And then you said it doesn't cause a problem because what really happens is that you create lots of little entities called the secretary and the chairman and the president and so on. But the secretaryhood of the secretary is exactly the same problem as the corporationhood of the corporation. Because the secretaryhood of the secretary is an abstract entity which exists continuously through time, which exists because of some possibly two-second act in which he has bestowed the secretaryhood by uh, an individual. So how can a two-second act of bestowing a secretaryhood give rise to a five-year-long <coughs> status of being secretary, particularly if the secretary never does anything, which is and I was, I was kind of secretary, and I was. Um, I didn't do much. Uh, look, I, this sounds to me a lot like traditional philosophy. I mean, uh, these sound like traditional philosophical puzzles. I always nail it down to real life. Joseph sent me an email, I guess it was email, and I promised uh, to come uh, to a workshop in Prague. My God, what was the mode of existence of the promise? What happens when we all went to sleep? Here, here there, there is a physical it. representative. Yeah, but I suppose, suppose, <laughs> that, uh, what a horrible thought. Somebody got into my computer and erased all of those things. I, I, it was still an obligation. I, I, it's just not a real life problem. In real life, what, what, what marks it out is we have a set of attitudes toward each other. We take certain things for granted. We have certain background abilities. Uh, we have certain dispositions. My God, there's another horrible ontological category. But, but disposition. Somebody calls me up and says, "Look, uh, can you um, I, I, I come I took, uh, to uh, Madrid and give a lecture uh, at the end of May?" And I say, "No, I have promised to go to Prague at the end of May." That's the, the kind of cash value that these things have. So I don't see that it's a real puzzle. Now, there's one uh, comment I cannot resist making. Reference to Mrs. Peter Geach. I once made a horrible error. I sent an invitation to Mr. and Mrs. P. Geach, and Elizabeth ran into me. Sean, she said, most extraordinary thing. I have received an invitation addressed to Mrs. P. Geach, like a tenant. There is no Mrs. 
Peter Leach, and if there were, I should be the first to know. I agree with a lot of what you're trying to do, Barry, but, but there is a... I, so I'll go to that after I, I come up with an objection, because I heard something about chess a couple of months ago in Buffalo. What I said then is that the, rule, the constitutive rules of physical chess are identical to that of blind chess, which, which evaporate the problem that I think you, you're after. But now I think you make it easy because you equate it to war, and I think I have a, this analogy for you. In, I could play chess with you while you play it blindly. That's, I, I've done it with people who play very well. We cannot do that with war. So I cannot be blindly. Yeah, the, 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 the analogy between chess and war is not perfect by okay. any means. But, uh, the, but, the, but the, okay, so then, then, well, okay, that's my point. Yes, but when, once, we have, once wars are fought on the internet, and the, 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 the federal government has invested $200 million into a new standardization of internet ontology called OntoWeb, because they think that future wars will be fought on the internet. They say. Well, uh, uh, tell us how they have it in you mind. Tell us they like the war games that them. children play. I mean, <laughs> you ask the federal government. No, no, no. <laughs> I, 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 I have standards and, and, and now, scruples. Now, the, the reason that I'm very sympathetic to what, to what you're after, I think, is that your response as to what exactly your naturalism commits you to seems, I think to Barry and to me, to allow for relativism. I mean, this is only one world, but let's say I promise I'm going to call you tomorrow, then I don't. And let's suppose people stop believing that I have an obligation. I think Barry and I would like to say, I have the obligation, even if people do not believe it anymore. Because the point is, something happened, which is somehow a fact of sorts, which is not dependent on whether people believe. So if people fail to see that I'm obliged to call you tomorrow, they're wrong. That is, I think, the problem. But I don't think that going towards the physical objects is going to solve it. But it's, it's somehow... Yeah, I, John said that I think that physical representations serve as the glue. I didn't say that. I said representations, which include mental representations. So I don't, I'm not fixated by physical representations, although they are needed for many provinces of institutional reality. They're essential to many provinces, but not to all. I agree with you. So I think that, that this is a real difference. Acceptance doesn't explain those cases where there is an obligation, even though no one... Yeah, but you see... I, I it's hard for me to take this problem seriously. Of course, uh, yeah, people might be mistaken. Uh, they might, uh, we might forget that I made a promise and something, but there has to be an acceptance of the mechanisms. Otherwise, we couldn't communicate to make a promise in the first place. But there has to be an acceptance of what counts as making a promise, otherwise communication is impossible. Now, once the promise has been made, of course, then it's an objective fact. It's an institutional fact that I'm under an obligation to do what I promised to do. And, but why is there supposed to be a problem about the ontology of that ontology? Well, your, your account just five minutes ago yeah. was that we don't need anything to endure to serve as a physical basis for the obligation because we have these episodic... Yeah, well, we have, right. But in this case, there wouldn't be the episodic cases of acceptance because... Yeah, but there would have been a, pri there would have been a prior acceptance of the obligation within an institutional structure whose terms are that the obligation survives the, the extinction of the act of creating it. That is that the acceptance of that mechanism that enables us to create the problem. Okay, the so, and I think that, that you need to do some work, or some work needs to be done on the status of those mechanisms, because neither are they a matter of acceptance, in the episodic sense, in which normal promises where people do remember that the obligation exists are a matter of acceptance, nor are they um, a matter of some sort of platonic entities outside. But what's the problem? I mean, here's, we have accepted a mechanism for creating promises. One of the constitutive rules of that mechanism is that once created, the promise, um, uh, once the obligation is created, the obligation survives uh, the act of creation. What's okay, if that's good enough, then why did you talk about acceptance? Because By unless me. there is an acceptance of the mechanism, you okay, can't create the promise in the first place. Yeah, but and yeah. unless, you, uh, unless you continue to accept the obligation, there's no way to, to enforce it. They, uh, what will okay, but now, you, now you're changing the subject. So, no, the subject five minutes ago... Ontology. Yeah, but you're changing the, 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 the point at issue here. Five minutes ago, you, uh, you addressed the challenge. How can a five-year-long, continuously existing obligation 
be explained in, in terms of a two second long utterance. And your answer was acceptance. Through the five years, there is acceptance. That's now, right. supposing there is no acceptance. Now you say, we still have the acceptance, which, which uh, uh, relates presumably to the two second. No, the expiring firing. of the mechanism okay. that so enabled me to create okay. the obligation in those two okay. seconds. And one of the rules of yes. that uh, mechanism of acceptance is that the obligation survives the act of creation. Now, if you want to know what enables it to function, it is continued acceptance. But if you say to, but if you say to me, uh, and here it seems to me you're changing the rules, because now we're not talking about what is a mechanism that enables it to function, but you say, well, suppose we all forgot all the same, there would still be an obligation. Yes, but that's because we initially accepted a system of constitutive rules that enabled us to create long-standing obligations that survive the moment of creation. Okay, so the acceptance plays two roles, at least. One role is in terms of a mechanism which enables the institutional rules, the constitutive rules to function, and one which enables the constitutive rules to come into play. To work. To work. Well, work sounds like function. Uh, just on the back, yeah. uh, I would like to connect this discussion to the idea of your rationality in action when you speak about yes and free will and so on. Yeah. That is make it. I have no physical criticism whatsoever towards rationality in action, but I do wonder that it has had some repercussions on your work on social reality. Now, when you say that this is a normal discussion, the problem do you treat that the end of rationality uh, is equally old fashioned. And now back to the obligation. If uh, Joseph sent you an email, the computer was erased, you still under an obligation, I would say, because you have a memory. If you have been in an accident, if you have lost your memory, no one would have said that you or under an obligation that would have been cancelled as well. And now comes my question. Why not simply accept dispositions when we make speech acts that we are also creating dispositions or even inclinations and then I'm perfectly willing on top of that to add uh, what you call gaps. Mm -hmm. You see my point? Is this it's not a kind of yeah. question for I have no objection uh, to appealing to this position. In fact, I did mention it um, briefly a few moments ago. Uh, the problem is, as I'm sure you know, it has a kind of sordid history in this. Uh, I, I remember I was brought up uh, by Gilbert Ryle and uh, other people at a period when they wanted to use dispositions for, I think, various illegitimate uh, purposes in philosophy. They wanted to get rid of the mental by cashing it out in terms of dispositions of behavior. It was a certain type of behaviorism. But I have no objection if, if we're talking about actual capacities that people have, where the disposition identifies an, an actual um, a capacity realized in, a, a, in the mechanism of the human being. Yes, that's fine. But then you can have an interplay between dispositions and actions. Actions in the sense yeah. of these gaps. Yeah. 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 Sure. Uh, Yoga? Uh, two points. Uh, one having to do with uh, the early discussion between John and Barry. I think part of the problem is with uh, that part of your doctrine, which I never thought is central, but apparently it is central for Barry's criticism, namely the uh, the sort of physical identity. I think I think you even use the the word like that, physical identity between X and Y. Uh, and I, I never thought this is very important, but uh, I believe Barry's criticism is really based on this, and he believes that uh, there is a reason to give up on this, and he would think this is the end of naturalism, which I think may be wrong. I, I think, I think uh, if, you, if you have a little bit more broad-minded concept of naturalism, you can give up on this and uh, remain a naturalist believing in one world. But I think you should sort of take a clear standpoint on this, because it seems to me Barry is right, at least up to this point, that there is a class of institutional reality where there is this identity going on, but there is also a class of institutional reality 
conform to all what you are saying except for the point of this sort of physical reality because you can't have institution, if institutional fact of obligation which is lasting if uh, you don't have the, the, uh, the physical object on which this, uh, this, uh, uh, this status function has been, uh, has been imposed. Is lasting. Is yeah. I'm trying to. Yeah. <laughs> or at least that's how, how it seems to me now. But I guess I don't see yeah. the puzzle. Yeah. Um, as early as speech acts, I pointed out in my derivation of yeah. what from is in 1964, um, I pointed out uh, that you could create an obligation by making a promise. And the idea that the obligation will survive the act of making the promise was never never seen a problem. Sure, but what, what's the... No, Why no, did I it mean, seem a problem? I mean, th th this is clear, yeah. but what's then the relationship... Uh, would you insist that nonetheless there is always this uh, identity uh, on the on the physical level, so to speak, between X and Y? That, that's the question. You see, I was always suspicious yeah. of terms like physical. Yeah. Um, and when I was same forced entity. to use it... You don't need to use physical. Yeah. When I, it when I was forced must to the use X it. and the Y be the same entity under two different descriptions? Well, you said in, that. Yes, all right. In the, in the case of the... In the classic case, obviously, yes. I mean, this object is money. This is my property. This yeah. is a Good. lawyer. This and you agree that they are the, the primary sorts of examples that you use in well, the, the initial to support uh, your... Yeah, that the initial examples okay. were speech acts. The initial examples were all speech acts, where the utterance is a physical utterance that... And in this book, it's act. driver's license, dollar bill, president. Well, the, the, the uh, driver's license, remember, is a, um, a, a status indicator. It's not a status function. Uh, remember, I, I made those discussions. Yeah, but X, it's still yeah. a case of X oh, yeah. counts as well. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so the there are all cases where there is a... I won't say physical. Well, there is an X term. Yeah. And it's now, a, yeah. one could caricature the problem with your book as yeah. follows. John Searle yeah. has put forward a theory of institutional reality in terms of the X counts as Y in context C formula. And the theory works, but only for those cases where there is an X term and a Y yeah. term. And look, there are all these cases, including those cases which you say are the heart of institutional reality, yeah. namely obligations yeah. and so on for which there is no X term, so what's the theory? Yes, and then I say, if you read further on, what you see is, the heart of the theory is the acceptance of a, uh, of a set of status functions. And the status functions are actually imposed on people. And, the, and the, the heart of the theory is not in the initial formulation, where, as I say, X counts as Y and it enables yeah. it to iterate. But when you get to where the real ontology comes out, it's all iterated. Uh, we accept S, S has okay. power, S does okay, so And that's, that is where I introduce an, uh, the discussion of the corporation. That is, in right. the case of the corporation, there is no X term. There is just the imposition of status functions, which enables people to have certain powers they would not otherwise have. Okay, but at the beginning of the book, in the preface or forward or whatever yeah. it's called, you, you, you tell a story about the French cafe. And you go through a long list of entities like prices and yeah. licenses and so on. And you suggest to the reader that you're going to give an account of the huge invisible ontology of social reality, which is illustrated mm -hmm. by prices and licenses and so on. That's, that's what I thought you were going to do. I thought, I, you, were and I realist, yes. I thought you were a realist about social ontology. Did I you really realist. believe that prices and licenses and obligations and taxes and all of these other things exist and that you're going to give an account of the ontology of them? Now, if that's so, then you believe that there are entities corresponding to those. Well, just a minute now. I, I, you didn't read the part where I also said, what counts is not the entity, but the process. <laughs> okay, See, but I think, okay, but then I you're not a realist about sentence, social ontology. When I hear Barry talk about it, what I hear is a parody. It's a caricature based on his obsession with one formula. Whereas, tell me about the rest of the book, where I talk about, well, actually, what counts is not objects. Objects are of very little interest in social ontology. What counts is our processes. And those processes have to do with the ontic powers. And that's the actual glue. That's where it really works. I agree with objects you. Objects are of no with, interest. I agree with all of that. But objects are of interest in the following sense. Supposing that somebody puts forward an, a, a theory of social reality of a... Um, a Rileyan sort, or a, a, a Kantian sort, or a Wittgensteinian sort, which said this: there are not really any social objects. There are just language games that we play, or beliefs that we have. 
the, 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 the whole talk about social objects is just a façon de parler. Now, would you think that that was good social ontology? I would show him a dollar bill. I, I had two points actually. Uh, the second is very small, but I think I really don't agree with your point about blips on the computer disk. I mean, uh, I don't see any important difference except for, say, the, the traditional way of speaking, but ontologically I don't see important difference between the banknotes and the blips. Only, of course, I mean, if you challenge somebody to try to buy buy goods in a shop with help of the computer blips, I'm challenging you to explain what are you actually doing when you when you uh, go go shopping. Because what I do is I just uh, ask for for some goods. I ask people to process uh, the card and. Somewhere in that process, if there were not the right computer blips, somewhere on the hard disk uh, in the bank, uh, the transaction just would not would not follow. So it's it's re I'm actually using the computer blips when I'm buying goods. Yes, of course. Yeah, of course. Okay. But, so, but so what when you sell your house, <laughs> when you sell your house or buy a house, there has to be somewhere usually a piece yeah. of paper which is a title deed. Without that title deed, the transaction won't go through. But that doesn't mean that the house is the title deed, or that you, that you could reasonably confuse the two. And similarly, the money is not the representation of the money. Yeah, I mean, you can... Uh, I, I definitely admit one can have a sort of narrower and wider concept of money, and one can have... one can have... Uh, uh, one can have alternative ontologies in this respect. I was just telling you that the, the challenge of are you using your blips when you are shopping? Okay, I is think yeah, this is, this is yeah. truly the difference between John's account of social ontology and mine. I think social ontology has to be determinedly realistic. Hmm. Taxes really exist. Money really exists even when it, its sole physical support, as we might say, is in the form of blips and computers. But hmm. the money is not the blips and computers. The money is an entity which is an abstract entity tied to a specific historical location. And, and yes. describing those entities is a real ontological challenge. At this point, John goes Wittgensteinian and language mm. gamey, and he says yes. all that matters is I the not process. Said anything about language. The process. <laughs> yeah, but it's the same. It's language gamey. It's game. not it's at all like uh, processes. No, no. It's all processes are game. what counts yeah. in society. But anyway, we should let that yeah, yeah, We still have two, two more things. So. Just, just brief reply. Yes, I mean, th there is. There is one other very important difference between you and yeah. Th th this is actually the one, namely, namely the the insistence on nouns and on uh, what correlates with nouns, whether it's substantives or substances and whatever it is. That's it. So, so I think I think this is this is really a problem, and we are going to talk about it tomorrow as well. Yeah. Uh, one last short phrase. Yeah, mine is very quick and actually it, it's related to yours. I think I remember correctly, in intentionality, early on you claimed that you were interested in the logic of mental phenomena and you yeah. wanted to avoid the metaphysics of it. Exactly. Which I think you, you did yeah. elsewhere. But uh, I think that that drags on a little bit and it helps explain this disagreement. Because to a certain extent you're still interested in the logical structure of these set of constitutive rules that, you know, somehow compose uh, institutional reality. And what Barry is asking for is what is more strictly speaking the ontology of it, the metaphysics of it. I, I don't know if that is a correct or illuminating way of, of explaining. Well, okay, let me say a little bit about that. When I wrote intentionality, I decided at the beginning I'm going to stay out of all those traditional hassles about the mind-body problem and all that consciousness and functionalism and all that, which just seemed to me a, a garbage heap. Uh, but in the end, I thought, well, I better put in one little chapter at the end where I say how it really works, because I don't think the mind-body problem is a big deal. So I did put in a little thing. But in, in the end, I couldn't sustain that. I, I could not sustain my indifference to the great philosophical debates about the mind-body problem. So I wrote another book called The Rediscovery of the Mind, which was a, an attempt to fill that gap. And then well, that's when I, I, also when I was having all these debates with people in computer science. Now, here, though, in the construction of social reality, I do begin with the puzzle that motivates the book, and that is to say, how can you have 
in a sense, metaphysical realism about society, about the um, money and property and government and marriage and all these things, when in some sense it is human acceptance or agreement or cooperation that, things that, that makes these things possible at all. So I didn't avoid the ontology, but I, when people say things like, well, it's an abstract entity, I, I reach for my gun, you know, that means we're back in bed with Plato and all that. So I want to avoid all of those traditional ontological worries and just ask yourself, how does it work in real life? Good. Uh, for the session, uh, we have a 